Welcome back to Reconstructing Relativity. This is chapter 15, the second uh, second chapter on the twin paradox. And there there will be a third one for sure. But uh, I just want to present better graphics from uh, my original, what I did in my original uh, twin paradox video. And also touch on some things that I kind of s skipped over quickly in that first twin paradox video. So here we go. First, I'm just going to let this... Uh, animation run and then I will stop and uh, look at a still picture and discuss the details a little more and then um, then I'll get into some of those topics I wanted to cover that I skipped over and uh, I'll put this animation up again later in the video but you, you'll probably you may want to just pause your video and uh, look at some of the still frames because I won't I won't take the time to stop on every still frame but let's look at one still frame this is the one that we uh, discussed in the earlier twin paradox uh, video so this is on the trip out you see the just let me describe the different parts of this chart the earth is top left and the uh, ship obviously down on the lower track now, it's not explicitly stated here, but again, this is case one where we're assuming that the Earth is not moving through space at all. And the ship is traveling through space at 0.866 C, so it has a gamma of two. The yellow lines represent distances in light years. So the Earth, see one, two, three, four, light years that's distance from the earth the yellow line for the ship is distance from the ship okay so 0.54 2.54 you'll notice that that because uh the ship's going 0.866 c those light years are it's, it's got a compressed it's got a two to one compressed length scale so two light years on the ship's length scale is equal to one light year on the Earth's length scale. Um, now the blue lines are timelines. So the Earth not moving through space, um, and up the very top left I have universe time. Not moving through space, the Earth's time is the same as universe time. It runs at the fastest possible rate uh, and there's no time skewing. So no matter where in the reference frame of the Earth, if you had a um, a way station at one, two, three, four light years, they'd all be reading the same time at the same time in state universe. Stop the universe, they'd all be reading the same time. Truly synchronized. Whereas for the ship, because of time skewing, because it's moving through space, in order to synchronize its clocks in the reference frame, there has to be time skewing. So where the the ship on uh, clock on the ship says one light one year, the um, reference points out in front of it in its reference frame are set back in time relative to that one year, and points behind it in its reference frame are set forward. That's all as a function of time skewing, as we've described before. So for this particular spot. We see that Earth measures the ship at two years out. The ship has gone less than two light years because it's going slower than the speed of light, right? So it's out there approaching two light years on the Earth scale, but not there yet. Um, and the Earth, any way, any reference frame point in the Earth's reference frame the clock would read two and that so that earth's reference frame would measure the ship's time as one because in fact in reality the, the ship's time is running at half speed now the ship although it's running at half speed its reference frame and this isn't in the key the reference frame of the ship measures the earth 
<clears throat> is going half of its own speed because of time skewing. If the if you had a, a ship station, what I called wagon train ship trailing behind our main ship, and it was passing the Earth at this moment, because of the time skewing, that clock would read four. So technically in the reference frame sense, the measurement is that the ship's reference frame measures the Earth time as going half as fast as its own, four to two. So there's the symmetry of time dilation. The two reference frames measuring each other's times and both of them finding that the other's times are running slower than their own in the reference frame. Now, one of the things I kind of glossed over, we can talk about right here, and that is that with all this crazy, you know, time dilation, length contraction, time skewing, it's not obvious, it's not intuitively obvious that both of these reference frames would measure the speed of the other object to be the same. But if you look at the Earth's reference frame, you see that the ship has moved, well, it's not shown here, but 1.73 light years. That's how far the ship is forward in the Earth's reference frame of distance. And the time is two on the Earth's reference frame at that point. And so 1.73 over two is the distance over the time. And that's 0.866c. Um, on the other hand, the ship measures the um, Earth to be 3.46 light years behind it, as shown in the lower left, at a time of four on its reference frame. So again, 3.46 over four is 0.866. So indeed, they do measure each other to be going the same speed despite all these um, <laughs> distortions. The, the speed is uh, symmetrically measured to be the same. And the second point I glossed over a little bit was I started using the phrase light years. And, and it's convenient for the twin paradox. Just a reminder though, light year is a distance. The distance light travels in a reference frame in one year. So it's not a universal constant, as we saw in the pictures I just showed you. Each reference frame will have its own sense of what a light year is, or a, uh, there are also light minutes, light seconds. Each reference frame may have a different length. And so it's, it's rather convenient, but remember that's only possible because C is measured to be the same in all directions. And the, you know, the result of that assumption, which is the, as I said in earlier videos, it's the only practical assumption is to assume that light travels the same. Mickelson Marley showed that the round trip of light is always the same, and that's a remarkable phenomenon based on length contraction and time dilation, but the time skewing comes as a result of the fact that we have to assume the one-way speed of light is the same in all directions, not just the round trip. Kind of know it's not true. Einstein kind of know it's not true, but it's, it's the only way to make a rational, logical choice of setting up a reference frame uh, with clock synchronization. It's the only thing you can do because you can't measure your speed through space. And the third point I kind of glossed over was I said that time skewing was V over C times X. Well, it's actually algebraically minus V over C times X. And... Again, what that means is in the state universe sense, I mean, these clocks are all synchronized in the reference frame sense. But in the state universe sense, if you stop the universe and check the clocks, you'd find that the trail synchronized clocks, the trailing clocks would be set forward in time 0.866 year per light year of distance behind. Every light year back, the clocks will be set forward that 0.866 year, that's a lot. And leading clocks will be set back in time, 0.866 year per light year of distance ahead. So you can see that in the in the graphics here. 
So as a refresher, when we first looked at time skewing, we had a time cycle of 30 clock ticks. Let's call it 30 seconds. If we call it 30 seconds, that means that the round trip was 30 light seconds. And the distance from point A to point B is then 15 light seconds. And that we found that to synchronize these clocks in the reference frame, the time skewing, the, the clock B, the leading clock, this whole thing's moving to the right. The leading clock had to be set back in the state universe sense by 13 seconds. And so there it is, 0.866 times 15, which is the distance, equals 13. The time skewing, the amount that the leading clock has to be set back in time to be synchronized in the reference frame. So I'm going to let this... Uh, Case one, run a couple more times. I definitely invite you to stop your video and study the numbers. Hopefully you're getting more familiar with how this works, the, the length of contraction, the time skewing, and the time dilation all work together uh, to give us the measurements we expect. Now, the next video, I'm going to come back with a more uh, difficult case. Um, so it's going to take me more time to prepare uh, in this next case, we're going to have both Earth moving through space and the ship uh, moving through space. I'll explain why. and uh, it's, it's a little more difficult, but it's a really interesting one. So hope you join me back for the next one. So that's it. Thanks for listening, watching. Please like, subscribe, comment, ask a question. Um, check out my book on Amazon if you feel like it, and let's head on out with this uh, really beautiful piece by Joni Mitchell. Give me some time. I feel like I'm losing mine. Out here on this horizon line, with the earth spinning and the sky forever rushing. On what each set of time and change is touching. Guess it's based on what each set of time and change is touching. Guess it's based on what each set of time and change is touching.